Very good evening to you, Jim. Um, just to let everybody know, uh, we'll be so I'll be talking and asking Jim questions for about twenty minutes, half an hour. Uh, if you have any questions you want to ask Jim, uh, I would suggest you get them in fairly early and type them in. And, and then uh, when we get come to the end of our conversation, we'll hand over to uh questions so jim tell me a little bit about your property background how did you get into property originally uh right uh i got into property uh, back in 1991 i remember it well it's a beautiful summer afternoon in june you must have been about three, you must have been about three years old jim i was yes i was uh uh, just slightly over three and I've been a college lecturer for many years and like a lot of things I love my job but it wasn't bringing me the uh, income the um, the rewards that I wanted uh, and so the sense satisfaction not that I don't dislike lecturing I still do lecturing as people know I do courses uh, events uh, I love speaking uh, and I'd always wanted to get into property, but I just turned to this, uh, what's say, midlife crisis, and I decided I'm going to get, I'm going to do property. I've been wanting to do it for years, but uh, I got married, and my partner, she, she, although I loved her dearly, she didn't want me to do this. Uh, and I felt property. I'd watched the price of property go up, uh, where I'd uh, seen a property you could buy for three thousand, became twenty thousand became 180,000. I thought, that's more than I was earning. That's just one property. So I decided to go and buy a property where I was, near where I was working. It was very easy because as a college lecturer, I knew the college was desperate for accommodation. In those days, students wanted houses by themselves. And uh, all the kind of accommodation they had in my area was with landladies. And mostly students didn't like the idea of uh, having a landlady to cramp their style. So I uh, found a property that's, uh, and I was very lucky with this, uh, beginner's luck. Uh, but you find that if you decide to make the move, uh, lady luck will often open the doors for you or look after you. It's funny how, um, it's funny how Jim, the successful property investors always have a lot of luck at the beginning. It's nothing to do with uh, a start off natural ability, is it? No, I, I'd like to say it's because I was brilliant. I saw the opportunities and I was really clever, but unfortunately it isn't. Uh, I had no knowledge about property. There was no nothing like yourself, Glenn, who ran courses and gave people this sort of cutting edge of how to do deals and uh, other things like that. They just weren't available. Um, there wasn't people like me. I could phone up and say, how do you do it, Jim? Uh, all you had is a few rather null uh, uh, landlords who had been doing it for 20 years, who knew it all, and reckon the business had played out because they had bought the property for 3,000. I was looking at this property for 35,000 pounds. And they went, ah, when I started 20 years ago, 3,000 pounds. Now the property is far too expensive. Uh, I'm gonna sell up or I'm waiting. And they all have this view that you could wait till the crash and get and buy the property back at some ridiculous price. So they thought that price is now running at thirty five thousand, would crash back down to three thousand pounds. Um, they weren't buying anymore, and I wouldn't pay that much for the property. So I didn't get any help from them. Uh, they were just quite miserable. And uh, being in a job, you know the definition of a job, the old joke, just over broke. Even though I had a, a fairly secure, uh, great job with the college lecture, I just didn't have the money. And I'd come across a book uh, which said how to raise a hundred to three hundred thousand pounds on your own signature. Um, hmm, that sounds interesting. How do you do it? And what it said is get a whole load of credit cards. And it showed you how to get hold of these credit cards. And in those days, you could get a credit card. If you're getting five grand's worth of credit, you can walk into the bank and take five thousand pounds out. In um, yeah, you can fill five lumps of a thousand pound notes. And that's what I did. I went and raised the money, 35,000, because there's no mortgages in those days, back in 91. It's only 1998 when you started to get uh, buy-to-let mortgages. 
The banks didn't want to lend to lenders. So I went, got myself 20 credit cards, got the money, and uh, went into the estate agent. You can't do this today, but a bag full of money and say, I want to buy the property. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, you get done for money laundering or something like that. Uh, and that's how I got started. Even though I borrowed the money on credit cards, I still made money on the property because uh, houses in multiple location, you let by the room, are so profitable. And that first property made five, about uh, uh, 20% of my income for that year. So even though I was paying credit card interest, which is high, the money from the running of the property was uh, so good that I was left over with £3,000 profit, uh, which, as I say, is about a fifth of what I was earning. And I thought, well, all I need is five properties to replace my earnings. Uh, and it wasn't too much to it. But then again, it was very simple. You know, had no HMO licensing, no housing standards, none of that nonsense at the time. In fact, student houses were considered exempt from any legislation uh, for some... Well, the reason being is... They didn't want to restrict the supply of student housing at the time, mm -hmm. so they didn't want to regulate it. That's how I got started. Uh, and then, as I say, Lady Luck came in again, because that's when uh, the following year they introduced free balance transfers. So I got some more cards and transferred the uh, balances and got zero for life uh, interest on my credit cards. <laughs> so I was paying no interest on them. Could that even get better? Oh, it's <laughs> wonderful. I went out and got some more properties, but unfortunately, that's when my luck ran out. Uh, I bought properties and just underestimated uh, how hard it was to uh, repair properties, to renovate them. I just bought properties because they were cheap and they were grossy. I thought, oh, that'd be fairly easy. You know, get a few friends around, or, uh, paint the walls, tidy it up. Wouldn't be too difficult. And that was uh, difficulty in rows with that one. Dealing with the building trades in those year, uh, those days was very, very difficult. And I can see it coming back to that. Whoever voted for Brexit, tell you what, you can't get your uh, extension done, you can't get your building work done, you die uh, with a wet ass because no one's there to wipe it. Put it down to the fact you voted for Brexit because where's your builders coming from? Where's your nurses coming from? Where are your cleaners coming from? Yeah, it's like, yeah, I've got my digging there. Sorry, uh, I'm I, up, I, I, don't I, let me ramble. Jim, I'm sure I put on my emails that you don't do politically correct. <laughs> uh, uh, so, um, hey, that's a joke. I mean, I, I spent 25 years in education <laughs> and I get told off I'm politically incorrect when I start doing property. What is it with property uh, people that they're so sensitive, or am I just a a dinosaur from the old age. I, I was teaching students. No, no one said I was completely incorrect. I was in yeah, but some, some of us are old school and think that if a child's naughty, it needs a slap on the leg. <laughs> and some people aren't. But we're not going into that one because we'll, we'll get a backlash if we start saying too much on that. Um, so what happened? Yeah. Well, I, actually, I'm going to tell everyone a story about you, Jim. I remember you, oh. you complaining about the council moaning about like a porter cabin you had in the garden. That mm. you were telling me you were getting around the regulations because they were using it, I think, as a photo studio. So they definitely weren't sleeping in there. It was a photo studio. And it took the council about two years in a big fight with you to get you to move this poor cabin. And when you got the final order to move it, you took down the fence and moved it next door. <laughs> yes, that's the great thing about um, when you do things like that. You just move it along <laughs> and uh, hopefully they don't catch up with you uh, for doing these things. Yes, the, it's a battle. I, I always find it very strange that I've never been uh, applauded for being a landlord, providing safe, low-cost, flexible housing, and yet we're supposed to have a desperate need for it. Um, and it's a bit, you feel like you're on the Titanic, the ship's going oh. down, and they're going, no, the lifeboat needs a, it's got a scratch on it, can't use that, that lifeboat, no, it's uh, got a, uh, a bit of damage to the seating, you can't use that. Okay. Uh, you're not, that one's not licensed, you can't use that oh, lifeboat. No. You're no. finding accommodation. It's better than living in a cardboard box on the street. Yeah, one of the biggest yeah. headlines I ever got in the local paper was they were saying they want to get to the bottom of what local landlord 
as receiving £650,000 in housing benefits uh, and that then more disclosure is allowed so they can expose the, the landlord. Well, it wasn't mm. 650, it was 850, but if they thought about it, that's only just over 100 houses in, you know, in housing benefit at £750 a month. Um, mm. So, yeah, it is. It's like, uh, it was almost a witch hunt. But, um, <laughs> I'd, I'd uh, have the uh, article on my wall with pride. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. So. Yeah, I just find that bizarre in as much as no one exposes the cost of social housing. I house tenants and they only pay me £60 a week to house uh, these tenants. And they're often homeless, they're vulnerable. Um, and because I was brought up in care myself, I had a sort of soft spot for helping people who are homeless. But I know it's never rewarded. I'm not going to get my reward. Maybe I'll get it in heaven if I ever get there. Uh, but certainly not going to get down here. I house them, and I have struggled to get them the housing benefit paid to me of mm. 60 quid a week. Yet that same person, if he goes into a hostel funded by the council, you any idea how much the, 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 uh, the hostel gets paid yeah, by the council? Probably that a night. No, it's uh, 600, yeah, about that a night. 600 pounds a week, yeah, mm. I'm only getting 600 pounds, sorry, if get 600 pounds a week, I only get 600 quid a week. So six, that is yeah, what, 60, like 90 quid a week, yeah. They're, they're paying for housing. Yeah. The enormous cost of social housing is never, ever mentioned. We need to, get, whole... we need to get you as housing minister, Jim. No, well, <laughs> so... the, the thing is, we can't knock it, because the reason there are HMOs is because there's a shortage of housing. Yeah. We can build hospitals in nine days to house a 1,000 people. Uh, we could house everyone. There would be no homelessness. And that, the problem with that is the price of the property would collapse. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's a, that's we're actually well. ingrating to the fact that planning is yeah. preventing housing, and that's what keeps the rents up and the price of housing. Supply so demand. I can't complain too loudly about it. So, Jim, 900 tenants and only five staff. Uh, we both know that uh, the ability isn't in managing the whole thing the ability is finding the first the good staff that are capable of managing it in the first place but how do you manage a 900 tenants how do you collect the money every week how do i manage it uh, i don't uh, unfortunately i abrogate responsibility to my staff uh, and i've got some really great staff who do it i used to do it all myself and i got fed up with it years dealing with that so i now employ people who enjoy what they're doing and that's the most important thing you've got to get people who want to work and that, that only came to me in the coronavirus when you found staff and you could almost pick them those who went oh uh, i'm going to uh, self-isolate at home i'm going to uh, i've got to uh, uh, not work and other staff saying, look, Jim, what's happening? And I said, it's a coronavirus. I've never come across anything like this in my life. I'm not telling you not to work, as far as I'm concerned. The tenants need to looking after. I'm coming to work. You can't shut down. You make your own decisions. Mm -hmm. And certain staff said, I want to work. Others said they didn't want to work. Mm -hmm. um, find out who's any good. That, and that, it comes to it. But staffing is the biggest problem you've got um, I know one in of this business. And when we you have, know that I know that no <laughs> one realizes it they have the box you learn on courses where they go you work on your business not in your business you can get someone to do it for you yeah. and it's really yeah. said by people who don't do it or just selling courses uh, <laughs> to make it sound dead simple yeah the, the only way to you're going to get properties Sorry? the only way to make that work is if you could clone yourself yes <laughs> That is right. I, I remember. Do it I remember. Certainly with, to start with. Yeah, for definitely. I remember with you that you used to get tenants who were in arrears to paint rooms and trying to get people who don't know how to paint to paint just to pay off their rent was like. For me, I was like, Jim, what are you doing? <laughs> You're absolutely right. I le I learned that lesson. I mean, you learned it before me. The the, the reason they're unemployed, there's a reason for it. But <laughs> I thought rather than throw them out. Uh, give them a chance uh, and unfortunately you do that i'd rather 
why is it that they can't pay the rent? They can work the rents off and it doesn't work. So uh, listen, in a, in a minute, Jim, I'm going to ask you um, what the differences are at the moment during coronaviruses and how you um, uh, are dealing with it all. But I just wanted to recap on an, another story. And I don't, you, don't know if you uh, remember, we have had a few nights where we've had a, a f- more than a few glasses of scotch each. And I remember one evening we were on a, the Sunbourne yacht, right, at the, where the property show was being held. I and I think well. you, yourself and Simon Zushi were sitting, chatting and kind of getting really deep engrossed. And it's when I stood up because I wanted to go to a loo, I didn't realise there was about 100 people standing around us listening. <laughs> that. I was, uh, yes. Yeah, a lot of people are interested in learning about property. Uh, and this, I love the same one. Yeah, it's, unfortunately, uh, it's, it's come back. It went. Yeah, about, it I has. believe it's set back there. Yeah, it has, it has so, come back. Yeah. I, I can't get the cheap tickets to sell <laughs> the cheap uh, rooms I used to be able to do uh, before. It's quite expensive. Okay, so Jim, yes. tell us what's yes. been your biggest challenge during this coronavirus. Um, a struggle. It, uh, it hasn't. I've actually been gobsmacked how so many of my staff, in fact, it, uh, um, it almost brings me to tears, how many of my staff have stood up and uh, taken on the challenge. You can see what happens in uh, times of uh, pressure. You get uh, Some people are what we call fair weather friends or fair weather employees, and others who say there's a problem, I'm going to get uh, get down and work in it, and uh, the challenge. I haven't. I've just been uh, amazed how good uh, people have supported the business and my tenants, uh, and uh, want to say, look, when this all happens, we want to have a job. So uh, I've uh, I've been really amazed by the uh, support I've had from the staff, and uh, that touches me because, as you know. I've had lots of problems with staff, um, and this is shown uh, uh, the ones who are really good. Um, well, I don't know. The simple answer is it's only happened for four weeks. Uh, rents are beginning to drop off uh, by tenants, but then the staff follow it up. The tenant hasn't paid. They phone them up and say, why haven't you paid? Then they go, well, uh, I wasn't sure I'd be able to pay uh, the, the rent this month. Uh, oh, why is that? You lost your job? Oh, no, no. Uh, we're on um, furlough, but the employers pay me 100% of the rent. So what makes you think you can't pay the rent? And it's just that challenge. You yeah. kind of phone them up and say, well, you don't accept them and not pay. You've got to say to them, well, why aren't you paying? And they can't come up with the excuse. Well, okay, but, you know, uh, got your card there, pay over the phone. Well, the good thing is the, uh, the Friday thing where... Um, the good thing is where they get their rent and then on Friday it's all of a sudden it's gone in the pub and they're like putting it out the pub wall. <laughs> that's that's a bit well, a bit out of the equation at the moment, isn't it? It is, but it's still you can still get alcohol, you can still get drugs, and you're absolutely right. Um, <clears throat> I I have a, a policy of uh, no evictions. I will not evict a tenant um, if they cannot pay the rents. As long as they behave themselves uh, they do the best to pay the rent. I will not evict them. Uh, it's, a, it's something I, I, I set as a, a policy. I thought, well, if I'm doing okay on property, I'm going to make sure that no one do is they, made homeless. Do they not all and just the, share that with uh, each other and all take the mickey? Well, that's the problem. They will. And I evict, uh, I evict a lot of tenants. I've done gone through the courts. The last count, 350 tenants are evicted through the courts and small clerks, uh, county court. A uh, lot, lot more I'm evicted by asking them to leave. But it's only, no one I've come across has been unable to pay the rent. They just willfully refuse to pay the rent. Or worse, and I can't understand that. And we've got it now. People are unemployed. We said, okay, don't worry about it. You can get housing benefit or universal credit is called now. So don't worry about not being able to pay the rent. We'll look after you. We'll get you to claim, uh, show you how to claim. We'll help you fill in the form or online now. You yeah, to literally, you have to go and that. sit with them and to do it, don't you? No, I'm not going to claim. <laughs> well, 
do you expect to stay for free? If you're not going to claim uh, and you haven't got the money to pay, I'll evict you. So make your choice. And no, I don't want charity. But you get claiming unemployment benefit. That's not charity, but so universal credit. What, I don't know what the logic is or something. So what percentage? You don't want to pay. What percentage of your rent roll do you collect every month on average? Um, on average, since coronavirus or on average normally? Both. Right. On average, uh, it's 90%. And surprisingly enough, I met some other large <coughs> HMO landlords and we're chatting about this and they say the same thing. It's almost standard. 90% of the tenants pay. Mm -hmm. uh, so 10% don't. It's, I think if you're a small landlord, uh, it's different. But when you're a, a, a portfolio landlord in the HMO market, you have a percentage of people not paying. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure about single lets, uh, but you get about 10%. We managed. With the, um, I, ma I managed to uh, uh, get a higher percentage of that, but that's because um, where I am, there isn't much choice in other rooms available or houses available. And literally, I only accepted tenants with guarantors. Uh, and the guarantors were prepared to give me their credit card details and allowed to take the money from their card if they were late paying. That's a good one. But you're in a privileged position. You know, I, I always envy you uh, with Milton Keynes. It used to be a joke, uh, Milton Keynes, many, many years ago. But you did really well. In my area, you struggle to get tenants, so you've got to take the best of what there is. And a lot of landlords have the same, um, are in the same position. Areas fluctuate, and with me, we're, it's a balance between voids and bad debts. Yeah, for definite. Okay, uh, anyone else got any questions, please feel free to type them in the chat box. Um, Gary Evangelist is the first person who's asking the question. Uh, it's got, it says lots of questions. Are you worried about HMO licensing becoming so stringent it makes it not worthwhile? Good point, Gary. Uh, you're as paranoid as me. But then again, just because uh, you're paranoid doesn't mean to say uh, it's true. Yeah, are, are we going to go the same way as nursing homes where they just make it over-regulated? There's two ways to look at this, Gary. Uh, one is, yeah, it's going to be terrible. And the, uh, look at the legislation. In the uh, 28 years I've been in this business, in the last two years, more has happened than in the previous uh, 26 years. A lot more has happened in two years. And it's, uh, as far as I can see, it may, I'm not sure, if it will continue. Yes, it will make, uh, it could do, but then you've got to be ahead of the curve because all they're doing is restricting um the supply of accommodation. So I would hopefully in my area become as privileged as uh, Glenn is, where Milton Keynes, they've got no choice. They have to take, they have to pay. Uh, so if you can stick it and you can adapt uh, to the stricter licensing conditions, it's going to shake a lot of landlords out of the uh, market, reduce competition. Wow. They just do the job for me. And it will put uh, the prices. Thing. No point pitching about it, Gary. Got to be ahead of it, realise where it's going and move and embrace it and think this is great uh, because you're now making the product even rarer. It's like diamonds. The De Beers restricted the supply of diamonds. There's plenty of diamonds. There's probably more diamonds than coal. But the reason diamonds have a price that they have is because they're restricted supply. They're doing that with property. They're playing into greedy landlords' hands, you've got to look at it that way. Or you're making the business profitable, but it's becoming, if you want to call it this way, I don't think it's more professional, but it, it sounds better to say it's making it more professional and you're getting rid of the amateurs' uh, landlords. So, yes, I agree with you, uh, Gary, but you can't fight it. You, uh, you can make the points like me, I bitch about it all the time. It's not doing anything good. Providing um, whatever you're providing inside, as long as it's warm and dry and safe, is better than the cardboard box on the streets. Uh, so, and Jim, you take I, away people's choice of money. 
I'm getting questions coming in far quicker than what we're asking them at the moment. So I'm going to ask you to right, try. Bu- time. Yeah, bulletproof your aunt, bullet point your answers and stuff. So that would be okay. Uh, okay, uh, ju- <laughs> just in one one word, which type of tenants yes. do you prefer: students, benefit tenants, or professionals? Professionals every time. <laughs> they all have their attraction. Uh, but if you want a trouble-free life and you want a, a decent business model, it can. You can make the others work. Don't get me wrong. There's, there's gold in every type of tenancy, but for ease, professionals every time. Okay, next one. Where do you think current HMO hotspots are? I don't know. Uh, I, I've never been over that. I don't even know my own market. Um, <laughs> if you're worried about hotspots, it's... it's uh, it's next door to where you are, down the road from where you are. Jim, so that's you're Jim, running you, properties. You can't. You, you, you can't. You need to do it yourself, especially start with. So you can't say you don't know the market. Whenever any of my students come to me with a, a, a particular property that's for sale around where you are, I, I'll just tell them where it doesn't work, and they'll go, "How do you know like that?" And I'll say, "Because Jim would have been offered it, and if he doesn't want it, it doesn't work." <laughs> <laughs> and then a few uh, times we've had calls and explained to them why it doesn't work um, but that's the thing isn't it when you're in a position you are you're going to get offered most things before it's on the market or before anybody else does um, so it, it's more about the properties that stack up and I'm sure you'll agree that the 10 or 20 or 30 room places work far better than the 3 or 4 room places um, and now the time, and now does the property stack up? Yeah. That's where it is. Mm-hmm. And, the, and the big problem now is even my area, where you pick up properties for thirty grand, they're now one hundred and twenty grand, and they don't stack up. Uh, they don't stack up as HMOs, and they don't stack up as single lets. Uh, the, the, the return on uh, after you paid your finance just not there. Um, right, last question from Gary. We spent a couple of days up north in some areas and not issuing HMO licenses at all. Is there a way around this? They're not issuing. They can, they can, can not issue HMO licenses. Well, you that... comply. They've got to issue them. Uh, the legal requirement is you to apply for them. So, Gary, contact me afterwards and tell me a bit more about this. So I don't follow that. You Probably what you're saying is Article 4, yeah. Where they're not allowing you planning permission yeah. anymore. That's exactly and that's happening all right. That's happening in Milton Keynes and has done for a long while, but that's what that's done is yes. it's kept the amount of HMOs um in Milton Keynes to a minimum and actually the room rents are actually going up uh, higher than most other areas. So um, right. Right. Birmingham was gonna be the same, the in Article Four there. <laughs> Wolverhampton did it. And they're not allowing HMOs again. Fantastic. It's not, there's two sides to me. You've got the lefty. I was a college lecturer. We're all bloody lefties. We care about society. We want people to have decent homes and all the rest of it. And then you've got the business side of things where Article 4 is great for business. If you're in, you're all right. Because you don't want competition. <laughs> yeah, I've got a funny crap. Uh, here you go. This is from Gregory. Uh, do you ever feel guilty for owning so many properties when many young people, in brackets, not me, are not able to buy a place for themselves because of restricted supply? No, uh, it's a simple <laughs> answer. Uh, because it's this is a spin. For some reason, uh, landlords, people really have a go at us. And we, since they took away the ability to discriminate against... Uh, people of nationality, against sex, against gays. Who are you left to? You can only pick on landlords, students and dogs. That's all you left to really abuse. And unfortunately, I think we're becoming, uh, getting hit. Look, if a house was uh, good enough for a first time buyer, it would be too expensive for me. It would be, uh, I wouldn't want it. I want something that's cheap that I can, as you were talking about earlier, does it stack up? It has to be cheap enough. I'm going to strip it out. I get the properties that no one wants. I'm talking about properties that have got tumbleweed in them. They've been empty for years. I'm not taking stuff out of uh, first-time buyers. We're not restricting supply. 
The main thing if you're, uh, if you're doing rent to rent, where you're, sorry, um, where you're doing uh, single lets, there may be an element of that. But most of the landlords I come across will not compete with a first time buyer market. Why? Because it's too, it's too expensive. They want bargains. They want below market value properties. And these are the ones where you've got the, uh, the maggots still there from the uh, poor old lady who died in the property and been left there for months because no one knew that she died. The property hasn't been touched for 30 years. And the first thing you've got to do is send in people in space suits yeah. to clear the place out and fill up skips. Yeah, I don't know which is worse, going into a property that's had 30 cats in it or going into a property where somebody died in it. And I'm sure you and I, you've experienced, like me, both. Yes. Uh, yes, it's not good, uh, particularly when I don't go in, I employ people to do it. That's the difference. I'm now, yeah, pick up the phone. Dan, got a job for you. <laughs> and Don, uh, bless him, got no sense of smell. We have him for really bad jobs. <laughs> so, um, Krasimir says, Jim, what do you think about extra charge on council tax? Some councils are thinking of being, uh, are doing. I think it's it's totally, uh, it's immoral. Uh, but again, like I was saying to uh, was it Gary? Uh, yeah. You got to embrace these things and look upon them uh, positively. If the council want to charge, because once they start charging by the room, and I assume that's what he's talking about, yeah, the tenant has to pay the council tax. So yeah. I don't have to pay the council tax. Yeah, so I actually makes it pay the council tax on the whole uh, But that's just hitting the tenants. Mm. Uh, and yeah, I don't think it's right. Uh, the but then again, I don't think it's right. I pay the same council tax as uh, a couple pay for having a, a house. I've got a, uh, I've got quite a few, what, what, two bedroom, three bedroom houses, and I pay the same council tax even though I've got, I've got five or six tenants living there. Um, and that's probably a little bit unfair. But there's not no fairness in this. You put the council no, tax up, it's just, you, you get charged. Uh, you charge tenants more, if you can. Okay, so Stephen says, what have you done with your serviced accommodation units in the current situation? I've let them. Um, <laughs> is that quick enough or do you want a bit more explanation? You've done them on long-term lets, yeah. Uh, no, I, I, I let them as uh, serviced accommodation. You're allowed to do serviced accommodation for key workers. Mm -hmm. And most of the people who are turning up to live in uh, service accommodation are, are in this area, because it's not a tourist area where I am. No. Uh, you, you come up and see Wensbury. The only thing that's worth seeing in Wensbury is, uh, where well, was Ikea? And uh, possibly me. Uh, <laughs> where else has Wensbury got going for it? It's a lovely place, I mean, the lovely people. But it's not a tourist attraction. People come because they've got an essential job to do, and the service accommodation is still going. We're missing the... Uh, shall I say weekend trade but uh, so the great thing about service accommodation is so profitable that yes you know, hit you know, you're not making you're covering your costs even at 50% or we should be and that, so we're carrying on letting during that period and we're just about covering costs uh, and then afterwards hopefully fingers crossed uh, we'll be okay Okay, a uh, little bit off piste, but Thembi says, uh, if one gets onto the property ladder um, with a buy to let before buying their first home, does it affect their first time home buyer benefits? Um, we're well, certainly going to pay an extra 3% on stamp. Uh, and I don't think you're going to be able to get um, uh, help to buy the 95% loan, are you? Outside my experience, Glenn. Yeah. Uh, so unfortunately, uh, same be, I'm not a sure. A lot of times since I'm worried about <laughs> buying my first home. Mm hmm Okay. Uh, Krasimir said. I, by, by the way, I, what I say is, don't worry about it. If you if you're uh, stopping buying property just because you're going to miss out on a grant or a few quid, property long term, fill your boots as fast as you can, as you can. Because you can only buy at certain times. And uh, one of the things I'm very grateful to you, Glenn, for is you introduced me to same day remortgaging. Yeah. I can believe it. Uh, and this is the problem with so many people in property. 
uh, and people say they do not believe it can happen. And I know it, uh, I can understand it because I felt the same day that pre you didn't really work. I find it very, uh, it's very odd. Uh, and then after a period of time, uh, so I thought, well, everyone else is doing it, let's give it a try. And I only did it for about five months before the curtains came down and the crash came. And in those five months, I got myself seven properties. If I had done it when you first said to me, Glenn, you should be doing this, Jim, uh, I'd probably have hundreds of them. <laughs> and it's it's almost like crack uh, cocaine. You get addicted to it because you so, bought your properties for nothing. You'd cash out a few thousand quid most of the time so, every time you got a property. So, Jim. And you make sure that it was rented out. You did well. So, stop worrying about what if, and I might make uh, save a few quid later on. Get in now. Get your boots filled um, while you can. So, Jim, if I said to you, you can still do same day refinance, albeit in a slightly different structure. I'm all ears. Okay. Can I come on your call? You've got to give me a discount. <laughs> we, need to, we need to have a conversation because you can, okay? All right. Uh, you know me. I'll always get away around most things. Yes. Okay, so um, I like this question, and I'm going to turn it into your top three tips for newbie HMO owners to make a little bit of extra cash for instance, like he said here, like coin operation washing machines, which incidentally I never found any good because people used to break into them and nick the coins. Well, that, that is actually sort of indicates someone who knows what they're doing. <laughs> Same problem with me. I, uh, coin, I tried once the coin operated um, machine, uh, electric, and it lasted three hours in the property. Uh, so 150 quid off of the machine, there was probably only about three quid in it, someone ripped it off the wall, disappeared up the road. Yeah, um, i tell you, what would be the top tips to maximise the income? Um, prepay electric meters, uh, you can now get metro meters, uh, they're only about 30, 40 quid. Uh, you, they, they operate through pay, uh, pay point shops, uh, etc. Uh, just give me, send me an email and I'll show you how you can do them and give you the details. That um, doesn't actually make much money for you, a bit like your coin operated washing machines. The only thing I find with charging for washing machines is you stop using them so much. What how I find when I fit prepay meters, so they have to pay for the electric in the property, is the amount of electric used by the property almost halves. Yeah, so definitely. it cuts that and you save uh, and you get a bit of money back. So I, so I could always, it. I could if I drove down a road at night and someone said, which houses do you own that are HMOs? You could tell which ones in winter because they're the ones with the lights on and the windows open. Absolutely right. That's absolutely true. The, uh, the joke is uh, Dad gives the, the tenant central heating so he knows even the depth of window, uh, winter, which properties he owns because he's got the windows wide open. <laughs> it's something you just have to learn to suck so. up being an HMO landlord. Yeah, okay. I'm proud my tenants are warm, they're dry, um, rather than living in a freezing house. And so I provide central heating uh, 24-7 as part of it. You don't get much appreciation for it, but I, it's something I'd like did to do. Did you put boxes? I've got to think of two more tips. Did, like, yeah, did you uh, put like electric, uh, like um, a, a guard overneath over the thermostat? to stop them being able to turn it down and just fix it at a sensible figure, at a sensible, like, 21 or something. Yeah, uh, I, I actually do a course, strange enough. Can I plug that, uh, Glenn? What, uh, what, yeah, 50 what? 50 ways Go to save and make money as an HMO landlord. Uh, I'm doing it online because of the coronavirus, <laughs> but also I, I used to have a, I do a one-day course, you come on. And because land, HMO landlords are so tight, it only costs 90 quid. Uh, maybe I'll put it up. 97 quid, I think, charge. And I wrote a book on money-saving tips. I've written about 15 books. So if you look on my website, uh, HMO Daddy, uh, you've got all these uh, kind of tips. But, uh, yeah, um, I find the thermostat idea is I don't lock it down. I hide it away and put a, 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 a dummy thermostat. It looks like the real thing. Stick it on the wall so they can mess with it as much as they want. Uh, and they think they're turning up their thing. But the actual thermostat 
is locked away in a cupboard and is restricts the um, level of heating in the property. <laughs> but you've got to get the balance right. See, yeah. a lot of the properties I have are quite big and rambling, mm -hmm. and you have to some uh, place you put large radiators at the back because it's cold there and small radiators in the other areas mm -hmm. and so that the the whole house is, is uh warm because you get one person sitting in a room freezing and he's one who wants to turn the heating on so, so you've got to keep him out I've, I've actually got a tip for him i used to run and i'm not sure whether I, um, if it's current at the moment so jim you want to enlighten me with that um but when they started introducing all the uh, deposit schemes and everything um it's one thing in properties but in hmo rooms uh i get gave up with doing deposits and i used to sell them the furniture pack so for whatever the deposit would have been i used to sell them the furniture pack of the wardrobe chest of drawers um desk whatever it was uh, and then tell them that if it comes back in good condition i'd buy it back for them at the same as they paid for it that's a brilliant idea right well yeah i'm glad i came on this webinar um <laughs> i've learned something and yeah i can't say it I've, I've got a legal background i sort of get into the detail of all these things as long as you're not guaranteeing to give the money back you just say you will consider it um buying it back if it's in good condition but it's, there's no obligation to it it's not a deposit uh and yeah that that is a a lovely way around the whole thing yeah uh, charge charge for that yeah i can't see you yeah i think you probably to avoid criticism you say the, the property comes unfurnished if you want it you've got to pay this uh and there is no legal contractual obligation on the money back. Yeah, just it save will, all the deposit issues uh, and all of that that goes with it. So yeah. then paying the 50 quid yes. insurance that you had to pay for each one. And with HMO rooms, because of the, the turnover, it was a pain in the backside. With a, a long lit, rented house, it doesn't matter if you're paying it into the you know the insurance, 25 quid insurance or whatever mm. it was. Um, okay, one more tip from you then, Jim, your turn. My turn. Um, oh, I'm struggling on this, even though I run a course with uh, telling about 50 of them. Uh, what would be uh, the uh, uh, tip I could uh, give you? Um, I suppose, master keys, I suppose, is the yeah. one. Uh, you, if you're going to have more than one property, start to master key them. You can go on the website, uh, you can see this where one key opens all the locks but each tenant's key only opens their lock and that makes life so much easier i've got a thousand rooms i've got one key opens the lock so i just walk around with one key uh, well it's actually two keys because i'm forever changing my uh, master locks I, I change them over every year or two and buy a whole new um, series just in case someone's got hold of the master keys um, and change them. So I walk around with two keys and that opens every one. So start off, uh, set up the system rather than try and change it. So first property, it doesn't matter if you've got five rooms in it, you have five keys, not too much will worry. But once you start getting more than that, so master keys is a very uh, way of making life so much easier for yourself. Do you not and use, then follow um... that up by keep an eye on the website buy yourself a key cutting machine for about 100 quid and learn. It's very easy to learn how to cut keys. If you want to learn the art of being an HMO landlord and what I do, uh, I run. Uh, you can come and work in my business. I don't charge you for it and I don't pay you either, but you can come and learn about it. It's for those who say, uh, I've got, I'm time rich, cash poor, I don't know how to do it. You, uh, Glenn, I'm sure, will tell people how to be able to acquire properties for no money or properties for free. You're the, the master at, uh, uh, shall I say, of uh, doing uh, the, the, the various strategies of acquiring properties for no or very little money. So the, 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 the experience of being able to do it, I can provide that because I've got so many properties and I've got the staffing. You can come out and help out in the business and learn it at the same time. No yeah. charge, and they give me free accommodation in my HMOs at the same time. So a way of learning the business. So learn how and to buy the houses. Learn how to buy the houses from me, and then learn how to run them from Jim. 
That's right. Well, you don't even buy them. You get them for nothing. <laughs> so I, I like the bit Strategy about is. I like the bit about the key cutting machine for a hundred quid. Um, do you not use um, key cut boxes on the doors internally? No, because same problem as really washing machines. Some of our little guys just smash the uh, key codes off and the boxes off the wall. We use it for our service accommodation because you have a completely different client base. Uh, for the, for doing that, but the key codes no, uh, because I'm so big, I can uh, afford to employ people twenty four seven. So the tenant locks themselves out. We have a, a policy of we'll go and let them in, no charge. Just phone us up, whatever time of day it is, we will we will let you in free of charge. I suppose that's another tip. Otherwise, they kick the door in and then pretend they're burgled or something like that. Mm. Someone intruders broke so the door have, in. So what, it's, it stops doors getting smashed. Do you like, because I, I never liked yell locks on individual rooms, I like the actual turn locks um, because of people going to the loo in the middle of the night and the door slamming on them and that, like not being able to get back in. So at least yeah. with the, the... You can always tell the HMO landlord exactly the same thing. We all say the same thing. Night latches, people lock themselves, and the door slams and all the rest of it. You've got to have a deadlock, which you have to actually have a key to lock it. Yeah. Uh, we've been through it all. We've seen it. Um, and uh, the night latches, yes, they're cheaper, but the long term, they're far more expensive. Okay, right. Well, we're just running time, Jim, because I keep these fairly strict to 45 minutes. Um, would you, I, I'd like to, you to sum up and just share a few words of wisdom to somebody who's thinking of getting into property uh, and thinking about going straight in the deep end with HMOs. Right, I congratulate you. Uh, you know, it's If you want to go straight in uh, the deep end as an HMO landlord, Learn, you've got to learn now. You, you can't do what I did, just wander off, get a few credit cards and just do it. Uh, it's a, so much more complicated, a business. So you've got to learn what you've got to do. But the most important thing I've got to say to you is just do it. You'll never be ready. I'm not ready. I don't know everything. Um, I know I've been doing it for loads of years. I get um, and the collie wobbles. That's a polite term to do it. When you take it on new properties, sleepless nights, you have to learn to put up with the stress. And the longer I've been in this business, I forgot the stress I went through. I just put it down to the fact I was a whip uh, and I couldn't cope with it. But uh, now I uh, get involved and help people get into property. The biggest problem is the stress that you're dealing with. And it's only money, it's only property. I think the coronavirus is going to cause a lot of people's mind shift changes yeah. and they're looking at death and they realize hang on a minute there's something more important than money or the loss of money it's the loss of my life or, or health True. you've Definitely. got to have an attitude that it doesn't matter it does matter but it doesn't matter too much that you end up making yourself ill or sick with worry yeah. you've got to uh, i think believe in something more than yourself that if you to go ahead and do it like lady luck uh, whoever you believe in will be there to look after you yeah because fear you cannot control everything fear creates procrastination uh procrastination just for me is like people getting ready to get ready to get ready to get ready um mm. and I, I normally say to somebody how many books on learning how to swim do you want to read before you actually get in the water or another good analogy right. is how many uh, books do you want to read on learning how to bike, uh, ride a bike before you get in, you know, get on the bike. And yeah, I think Jim, you can or I can give them stabilizers, hold the back of their saddle. We can give them rubber rings and armbands and hold their chin. Um, it's far cheaper to pay for a, a training program than to try and do it yourself and end up costing you a lot of money. So there we go. Um, I think that's a very important point. Right. I agree with you there, okay. Jim. Thank you very much for joining this evening. Uh, uh, short notice as well. Um, I'm sure uh, everyone will join me in saying thank you. Your knowledge has been invaluable. We've had uh, many a long evening with these types of conversations, trying to put the HMO and landlord world to rights. Um, 
just to let everyone know, I'm running one of my master classes that I normally run twice a month, one in London, one in Milton Keynes, online on Saturday. If you want more details of that, it's free. Uh, it's a whole day's overview on buying properties creatively so that you never run out of money. Um, so uh, drop me an email if that's of any good to you. Um, thank you, Jim, one more time for joining us. Can I just say, Glenn, it's always a pleasure. I just love talking about property. And if anyone wants to uh, contact me, HMO Daddy website or Jim at HMO Daddy, please do. And please go on Glenn's courses. I've been doing the business for years. And what I do, we came down. Are you not running it in the Ritz Hotel anymore? We had a <laughs> wonderful four day course. I sent friends on it um, where you do this. Glenn is the master of doing it. Uh, Ways that I even I would bulk at doing, but this is you're learning from the man who shows you how to take it right to the line, um, and uh, very successfully. So I will be uh, hopefully join you on one of your other courses. You allow me to do so because I always learn from you, Glenn. As I say, learn the tip about charge for furniture. Uh, it's always uh, it's always a pleasure to learn and uh, do this and it's been such a uh, great time uh, thank, uh, thanks Jim and before thank we you. thank you and before we scare everyone to death one of the things I always ask people at the beginning of the course is uh, are you the type of person that does 110 uh, in, a, in a 70 or stays to 90 or stays to 70 um, because once I understand your um, uh, risk profile um, I, I will never tell you, I don't do politically correct, I'll tell you how it is, but I'll always tell you the consequences. So for me, it's um, obviously illegal is wrong. A lot of people still do 120 in a uh, 70 mile an hour, but as long as it's, it's legal, there are still consequences sometimes, like for instance, renting out your own property without telling the mortgage company when you've got a principal private residence mortgage on it. The main consequence is that is not the one that most people think uh, of um, getting a slap on the wrist and getting an increase in rent is the f uh, in mortgage payments. It's actually the fact that they're not insured. Uh, and the insurance, if the house burns down, will get out of having to pay if you haven't got permission to rent it. So it's that type of thing that I'll always share with everybody. Um, as I said, thank you, Jim, for joining us. Uh, I've had a really good evening having a chat with you. Uh, and most of all, everybody out there, um, stay safe. Uh, we've got a Jeep on tomorrow night, our mortgage broker, with any updates that's happened on the on the mor in the mortgage situation. And I've got one of my uh, wealthiest clients, um, Jamie Chapman, chatting to us on Monday. He's been developing for lots of years. He started off in property doing the no money down stuff that I taught him some years ago. He's recently, last couple of years, bought himself a £7 million house just to tell you kind of level he's at. Uh, he's going to be talking to you about his developments and what challenges he's been having on Monday evening. So thanks very much for joining us. Uh, have a great evening and be safe.